Welcome everyone to another episode of What's Working in E-Commerce. I'm your host, Egan Heath from Caravan Digital. We're a digital marketing agency for e-commerce brands. We do paid search, paid social, and email automation. And speaking of email, today I'm speaking with Arenas, who's an expert in email marketing. Arenas, thank you for joining us. I'm excited to dive, dive into it. You know, it's mid Q4. Email's important. Uh, gotta make it, gotta make the most of it. That's right. That's right. Tell us a bit about you know what you guys do at your agency and if you can give us a sense of you know what you guys see working right now. Yeah, good question. So we do two things: email and SMS. So we're obsessed with with that. The rest of the things we we leave out. Um, that's that's what we've what we've started with and what we're going what we're moving into. Um, right now, you know, Q4 is happening. That's a big opportunity. I'll talk about, like, for example, Q4, what you can do last second, and I'll, then I'll dive deeper into, into what we see working in general. So right now, for a lot of brands we work with, especially if you're a larger brand, running prospecting campaigns and paid ads can be a lot more challenging because paid ad costs are going up and getting new clients profitably can be a lot more difficult. So then it's more focusing on retention and retargeting to generate the sales. This is where email and comes in as well. What's working for us is... Um, so before Black Friday, so on Monday, we started a strategy where uh, starting October, we would focus on re-engaging uh, customers. So then people who haven't been opening emails, people who aren't recent uh, openers and clickers, um, we try to re-engage them. We try to get them to open up emails and click again. Afterwards, we moved on to more of like a warm-up campaign where uh, a tactical email we do, and this is actually pretty cool to do from time to time, you can send emails to ask people to reply to those emails. The reason why is once a person has replied, they'll be saved in your contacts, in your emails. They're higher, there's a higher likelihood of them going to the primary folder. A uh, quick little life hack. A lot, a lot of people would say like, oh yeah, go here, click this, click that, uh, add, them, you know, add them to the contact list, but just replying is a lot easier. Are there strategies or tactics you guys use to sort of get people to reply? Yeah, so so it can be asking people questions. For example, if it depends on the brand, right? Uh, it could be for existing customers. It could be asking, what, like, what has been your favorite product between, let's say, pick one or two. Or once someone has placed an order, we can ask them to reply to the email and, and maybe give them, like, ask them for a testimonial, ask them for rating, something that feels very natural. A lot of times with these emails, you want to do purely text-based messages to where it looks like someone from the company is messaging them. Um, you can do this with an abandoned checkout, you know, having like a PS, hey, if you have any questions, feel free to reply and ask. Then, you know, once someone replies, the customer support team will be able to message them. You can do this with existing customers, asking them how do they enjoy the product, if they have any questions about the product, or maybe if they've purchased multiple times, uh, what could we do to make the customer experience better? So asking them genuine, genuine questions with curiosity that, that just feel natural in the conversation. So a lot of times people try to overcomplicate the email marketing. If, you know, we, we, we look at Occam's razor, uh, we use the mental model. The, the, the simplest thing is, you know, the one that's typically right. Have a conversation. Imagine you're talking with one customer, your ideal customer. How would you, like, how would you start a conversation with them? That's the mentality, that's the mindset you, you should have and how you should start these conversations, basically. Um, yeah, tactically, as I said, text-based emails, just your CTA should be asking them a question. Uh, do something that makes them curious and maybe there might be a giveaway, like ask them, hey, do you want to see special deals for Black Friday, Cyber Monday? Or are you excited to see special deals for Black Friday, Cyber Monday? Reply with yes, if you are. It's so, like you, you make the decision for them, Still, very conversational. Yeah, and those replies, like you said, that's going to you know increase not just your open rate, but your deliverability rate, everything in terms of you know to the email service providers or to the email tools, you know the the clients or the you know you know the what, what am I saying that you know Gmail, Yahoo, etc. What are those called? E ESPs, email service providers. They are email service providers. Yeah. So you're, the the ESPs see that and they say, okay, this is they're engaged with this brand. We're going to bring these to the inbox. Is that is that part of the reason we do that? Yes, exactly. Because once you reply, your email is like our email, the sender is being saved to their contact. Um, so then, you know, these ESPs see us as a friend, you know, as a colleague, as a person we have a conversation with. Your clients also sell into Europe and you have some expertise in how is it different selling in US versus Europe? Can you talk with us about that? 
Very good question. Um, so what we've seen with a couple of brands we've worked with in, your, in the U.S., a lot of times you can take the products that are working in the U.S., copy and paste them and sell them in Europe. A lot of people I know who've made eight figures, nine figures, brands that have like really, really scaled massively, they have taken, they have kind of like borrowed ideas, <laughs> politely saying, from the U.S. and then took them into Australia. For example, Davy Fogarty. I had a conversation with him in Miami. They acquired a brand in the U.S., you know, uh, taking the ideas into Australia. Um, same with a fl- friend of mine, Flores Huttacher, Joshua Katz. They see what works in the U.S. and they take it into Europe. And the way the way it works and the way it's different is if you want to go into the US, Europe and really scale, you want to do localized languages. In Europe, you have a lot of countries. For example, Ger- Germany. The market's pretty big. You have 86 million people. But they like you want to advertise them in German. You want to be seen as a German company, as a native company. And to be fair, getting started on that is a lot easier than it might seem. Um, all you really need is you need to find a translator, find a college student, do customer support, and and you know find maybe like a voice or act, actor for paid ads, and you're ready to roll. You can reuse, copy, and paste your same la- basically landing page and website into into the European markets. There is a caveat though. Um, a lot of times, selling in Europe is not as aggressive as selling in the U.S. In the U.S., you have a lot of scarcity. You'll have a lot of like you know those like red banners, countdown timers, so on and so forth. Germany, on the other hand, you'll try that. You will you know burn money in ads. It will be terrible. What you need to do instead, a lot of times in Europe, is sell more logically. The best way to understand this, Google and listen to U.S. radio ads and European radio ads. They are like the tonality. U.S. is always like they're yelling, they're going in your head, do this, do that, do that. Europe's a lot more laid back. And that's how you advertise there. So the landing page structure, for example, in Germany, you do very simple site, three colors, very uh, feature-driven, benefit-driven, and you also need to show a lot of social proof. If you've won design awards, if you've been featured on... on, on uh, uh, new sites that is very important in their country, and the selling there isn't like in the U.S. where you would tell people, "Hey, this is a product. This is why you should buy it. Go buy it, buy it, buy it." It's more like, "Hey, you know, this is an Apple Watch. These are the features of the Apple Watch. These are the benefits of it. You decide. Want it? Yes or no?" That's primarily because uh, America, America is very, very used to paying with credit cards, so people don't pay with their own money. In Europe, however, we use a lot of debit. If you're a company in Germany, and if you have too much, like if you have, have just too much credit available, the government will penalize you. So people here are very used to uh, using debit. There are people like I personally have a credit card. A lot, like some people have credit cards, but I will tell you this: most businesses, most people, they only use debit. So they're actually paying with their own money. They're not making decisions sporadically with like, hey, I want to buy this school, but they actually feel the pain of the money leaving their bank account. The, the, the only trick here is what's now hot, hot in Europe are a couple of payment processors. So if you sell, sell here, you need to use different payment processors. One of them is Klarna. So it's buy now, pay later. That is where the credit comes in. In Germany, you want to use Klarna, PayPal, you, you know, debit credit cards. In uh, Netherlands, for example, again, you use Klarna. You use a tool called Ideal. Ideal allows you to do bank transfers, uh, cards as well. Same thing with Sweden. Instead of Sweden, you don't have Ideal. You basically have Klarna, Klarna PayPal, and, and cards. Um, local payment processor is important. Eastern Europe is very cash and delivery focused. If you can nail that, you can really, really scale. This is utterly fascinating, Raina. So there's cultural differences in how people buy and so how we advertise or market to them. And then there's also just sort of, I guess, cultural, but also sort of economic differences in Pain and credit versus debit. I, this is utterly fascinating. I've never heard of this. It strikes me that you know all the direct response marketing books I've read are really geared toward U.S. consumers, and so it's it's totally fascinating to think about that. I have to ask. It, maybe I'm just coming from this American mindset, but you know our feeling as marketing consultants and marketers in the U.S. I think if we're direct response marketers, is people buy on emotion and they justify with reasons later. Is that different in a place like Germany? 
So I will tell you this, going back on the direct response stuff, direct response still works. Like it, it is so weird. What I was talking about specifically was more for like branded, you know, for like brands or, you know, e-commerce stores, but direct response can still work. It's that still, it might not be as aggressive as it is in the U S but still the same principles of, for example, if you, I don't know, you sell info products or courses, you want to make the thing kind of seem magical in a way, but you know, in Europe, you can't go too over the top. We can't have, you know, Agora's end of America scenario. Um, but you know, we can still be very aggressive with, with the advertising, um, going back to your question. So the question was, do people buy and justify later in direct response marketing? The thought is people buy on emotion and rationally, they come up with reasons for it after the fact. And they, they may say, and they may tell you, this is why I bought this boom, boom, boom. Here are my German style reasons. But actually that moment of decision was an emotional thing. And there's actually some, you know, psychology to support that. Is that really different in other cultures? Like, I'm curious, where does emotion come into play if we're selling to Germans, for example? It does come into play. Germans are a very specific market to where, like, you know, Netherlands or Sweden, you can market a lot more aggressively there. But Germany, they're very conservative as people. So, like, they're very conservative. They're Like, if you're going to meet with, uh, for example, Germany agency owners or business owners, they're very conservative, silent, very well put together, organized that's how most people there are, and that's their natural tendencies. And for example, Netherlands or other countries like France, you can go a lot more aggressive. Germany is like a, like somewhere where you sell a lot more logically than emotionally. I would still say, like, it's not like they have no emotion. It's that instead of, for example, in the U.S. where you might have, I don't know, 60% emotion and 40% logic, it might be 60% logic and 40% emotion. So you still have that. It's that a lot of times if you try to sell through emotion, you need to justify that emotion with logic, right? Um, that's how I would say it. A lot of people still buy with emotion then justify with logic later. Um, for example, that's, that's why in Europe we have Klarna, right? You know, that, that allows you to buy things you can't afford. That's, that's really what credit is. Uh, same with credit cards. So Klarna is like the equivalent of something like a credit card, but it's more like a... It's like Afterpay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Okay. I'm, it, it, I just have to ask you about this because we haven't had anyone on the show talking about this piece of internationalization and I guess localization too to the you know, national cultures and things. Can you tell us a little bit about, for your brands or for your clients, you know, is this a Shopify site that gets localized where the whole site is then translated and depending on what country people are in, they're seeing it in their language. And then how do you handle that and say a tool like Clavio? Do you have different lists for each country in each language? Like talk to us a little bit about that. Depends on the setup. You have uh, three main setups. One is Shopify markets. The other one is Shopify plus, which is similar to Shopify markets. And then you would just have new Shopify store per uh, country. They both work very similar. New Shopify store per country, very simple. Each Shopify store in a different language, hooked onto a Klaviyo account. There you go. When it comes to Shopify Plus and then Shopify Markets, you have one Shopify store with a subdomain, for example, uh, de.brand.com, uh, nl.brand.com, right? So you have that. Then it's a lot more tricky. Um, those those shops you need to use a lot of segmentation, conditional splits, so on and so forth, to kind of like pinpoint out where they are coming from, uh, whether that's by domain, by IP, uh, so on and so forth. It's all in one account, but it just gets extremely complicated. There's a lot of moving parts, and the more countries you have, the more difficult it is. Other people who are at the higher level. Uh, typically like nine figures or so, high eight figures, they typically build their own CRMs and they just have one domain. If someone jumps into the site, it's automatically being translated in that that language. Um, there is a brand selling like it's similar to FitT, the brand, uh, and they do the same thing in, in Europe uh, and we're working with them. And that's, al that's also like the, the thing we do like... Uh, yeah, with a lot of the brands in Germany, like we're the only ones who can write the emails in practically any language. Uh, and it's very difficult to write in these languages because a lot of times you could find someone, uh, maybe like a, like a random writer, they might not do a good job. To start and test out, you can do, for example, translations and hire someone quickly just to test it out. But to really scale, 
you need to nail uh, the language and whatnot, which is still possible with language agency, so on and so forth as a brand, uh, you know, you can definitely do that. What I'm hearing is do not just throw this in Google Translate and think that's going to do it. Oh, Google Translate is terrible. Uh, if you want to do Google Translate, use Deepl. So it's deepl.com. That's not that's a better alternative. I want to turn a little bit to launches. You you've run some very successful launches. I see a a pinned Twitter thread about this. Talk us through you know what you've learned and maybe even give us a little background and kind of your experience and what size of launches you've done. And then can you walk us through these steps that you have in the Twitter thread and how you think about this? Yeah, so product launches are very effective. That's some a similar strategy we're using right now for Q4 to launch a Black Friday seven Monday deal. Last year, we had a company, their monthly revenue was roughly, it was called, their skincare company, Manila. Their monthly revenue is around like 150-ish K for their D2C side. We had one email that did 138, 136K euros in sales with one email send. And that's because of the strategy. We had another brand we, uh, we were working with and we launched a fitness product. Uh, and it did 251K in 24 hours. 137k came from just email marketing and the way we do this is not just by sending one email as most people do we separate this out into four phases so we start off with the phase one which is the hype up where we get people excited we tease the product and we show them that something is going to be launching um, we don't need to talk about the specifics or whatnot but they just need to know that something's going to be there this is very important for black friday cyber monday too we're launching we're teasing there's going to be a sale we're teasing, you know, what the sale might be, what they might see. Um, just so just so people, you know, think and they know, like, hey, for example, I have a paycheck coming up. I'll spend the money with you rather than someone else. Then we move into the uh, pre-sale or the commitment phase is where we basically get people to commit to uh, buying the product and whatnot. Last Q4, we so I'm, I'm paralleling this with Q4 because a lot of the things are the same. Uh, a simple commitment of someone like even signing up to get early access to the Q4 list can have can drive massive sales. We had a brand called The Birth Poster, and for them, every email we collected, go coming up to you know end of October, start of November to Black Friday, generated ten dollars in sales. And typically, you can acquire an email for one to three dollars. The same thing here is we either drive them to a pre-sale page if you're launching your product and you're not sure whether it would work or not. You can get pre-sales and then see you know what's the what's the uh, uh, feedback from people. So you can also fund the product and fund the shipping and whatnot. Uh, and yeah, like, yeah, your MOQ. Uh, then it's also, then, then can also cre be creating landing pages where people can sign up to get early access. So getting these micro commitments can increase the way they, they uh, uh, increase likelihood of them converting. Then we move into the sale launch. And this is kind of like separate in two phases. The sale launch is where we initially send the emails to people who have, have, who have had these micro commitments to get them to buy. And then afterwards, we do the big sale launch to basically people in the email list, engage people, so on and so forth. Uh, and afterwards, we do the follow ups with people who haven't purchased before. And we're actually very aggressive with these follow ups. We're emailing people who haven't, uh, you know, who have opened the emails but haven't placed an order. The same thing we're doing for Black Friday, Cyber Monday. We're sending two emails a day throughout a large chunk of the month. Um, and, and you have to be aggressive during these times if you really, really want to sell big and sell out. Mm -hmm. S same in Europe, you're, you're sending that many? Uh, so in Europe, depends on depends on the country. Uh, if it is, for example, Germany, we would because uh, the aggressiveness is more determined by the copy. The reason why we do send that in Germany as well is because the competition is like smaller, so we stand out even more. Can I ask a little bit of you know, privacy laws, GDPR, things like that? How has that affected what you do, and are there you know things you've done to work around that or to be successful despite those challenges? Um, good question. So number one, it's like a lot of the issues you might have with privacy laws is email collection, collecting enough emails. A lot of it is... Uh, for example, with these product launches, this is an easy way to collect emails and get consent because once someone opts in, we can get their consent, right? You can run ads to your existing audience, your retargeting or mid-funnel traffic and get them to convert. We can collect their data. Sometimes you can even try top of funnel as well. For Q4, with some of the brands we're working with, for the early Black, Black Friday, Cyber Monday list, we are doing top of funnel as well. Um, 
then another way is through checkouts. Um, so abandoned checkouts is a very gray area, but this is still kind of, it's a very gray area, but it still works. You need to have your privacy privacy policy set in a way that you can message people when it's regarding their order. So if someone has abandoned a checkout, theoretically, if they haven't ticked the marketing box, you cannot message them. But if your emails are regarding their order, you can. That's the same thing if they don't agree to marketing messages and or like, you know, and they don't agree to marketing and then you send them transactional messages. And within these transactional messages, you can put in some CTAs. You can put in stuff like that. And a lot of times you can message non-buyers, for example, even a while after they've abandoned a the checkout, you just have to make it so it talks about their order or that the fact that their order has failed. So that's a little sneaky way. It's a bit on a gray zone, but it's more white than, you know, white hat than black hat. Um, then, then the last but not least is having a pop-up on the site. The people who opt in for the pop-up, we can get, you know, a, like a lot of them to, like they would just be consented. And if you have, let's say, a 3% conversion rate, you have, let's say, a 10% abandoned checkout rate, and you have a 10% uh, uh, conversion rate for your pop-up, you're effectively collecting, you know, the same amount of people you would have in the U.S. with, with the uh, abandoned checkout. So um, if you're not doing anything, it is going to be an issue. But if you just have the basic setup, it's fairly simple to, to collect the emails and collect data. SMS, however, is a lot more difficult. It, we do SMS in, in the US, um, UK, and Australia. Europe, I wouldn't really touch with SMS because the laws are, are changing country by country. And to be fair, email with GDPR, they're not as, you know, le like not as aggressive on. Unless you're doing $100 million, million dollars, like euros a year, they will not really care. With SMS, though, you can get in big trouble for small things. So SMS, I'd say, if you don't know what you're doing, stay away. If you are, cool, go for it. Yeah, thank you for talking about that. Yeah. Yeah, people in Europe use WhatsApp as well. So WhatsApp is more important than SMS in Europe. I will tell you that. Pretty interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask how nervous are, you know, seven to eight figure brands about this? It sounds like on the email side, they don't need to be as much. On SMS, they can be. Can you talk to us a little bit about kind of the tools and strategies you're using with SMS? And I'm also curious to hear about, uh, I think you said WhatsApp too. So um, I'll start with the WhatsApp side. To be fair, that's something we're exploring. Uh, it's something we haven't given in, into, but uh, a friend of mine working at Via, like he runs Via Customers, so it's an SMS company. Uh, they wanted to do SMS in Europe, and I told them about it. The issue, sorry, WhatsApp in Europe. The issue there is there are so many carriers for SMS, number one. And number two, for WhatsApp, WhatsApp is very expensive to send messages through. So they kind of abandoned the project. And that's why, you know, PostScript, Attentive, Clavio, they're not really trying to get into Europe because it's so complex. For the money they would make, it's not really worth it. Strategies with SMS. Uh, I will just keep it simple. Use SMS alongside your email marketing. It's they are both supportive marketing mechanisms to your core. So, like, if you have, you know, imagine a body. You have your backbone, right? That's your paid ads, your SEO, your acquisition. Email marketing is your rib cage. Email is one side of the rib cage. SMS is the other side of the rib cage. They are supportive marketing mechanisms which hold everything you have together, right? That's how you should look at them. Use email and SMS hand in hand. You send an email, um, you send an email, you can send an email, you can send a text message, you know, at a different time. If you have an abandoned checkout sequence, you can send an email, send an SMS. So if they don't see the email, they could see the SMS. And you might have people who you have on email list and you don't have it on the SMS list and you can leverage them both. Going back to product launches, if you want to grow your SMS list, here's a cool trick on how you can do that. And this, this is why also product launches are so powerful. Uh, I was talking about phase two where you have commitments. You can have commitments for email, but what you can do is for your email list, make the product launch SMS exclusive. So you can send a QR code in your, in your email, which people on mobile can tap or people on, on desktop can scan and they would get opted in to get early access. And there's a clear incentive for them. You can play around with this a lot. Um, this the same thing can be done. Like you could, for example, have on the paid ads front, you could ask people for emails to get to get early access to Black Friday, Cyber Monday deals. On the email front, you can ask people for their phone numbers to opt in and get you know Black Friday, Cyber Monday deals. 
So these are, these are like creative ways to do that. And, and with these QR codes, you might have a tool, a growth tool, to where if they have a link, it opens up their messaging app. They need to send the message and they've opted in. As simple as that. In, in the US, you, that's pretty much all you need. In Europe, you would need, they send the message, you get the message, you reply, and then you fully opted in. But in Europe, I'm not going to talk about it because too, about it too much. We don't really do SMS in Europe yet. And it's, and it's um, a bit too complex for brands to do it on their own. Thanks for sharing all that. That's, that's really interesting. We're going in tactical, man. I love it. Rainus, is there anything else I should have asked you about here? Anything else you want to share? Something about a recession. So recession and everything, that's going to be difficult. I will, like the thing I want to leave you with, you as business owners, uh, I have a saying, when it gets easy is when you go hard. I, I'd say the opposite is true too. When it gets hard is when you go hard because everyone's going to be struggling. A lot of brands are going to be struggling. Remember this, the market is still there. The market is just smaller. You now have an opportunity to take market share. So once we recover, you have more customers, more sales, and you might be only like a tiny portion of a market. You could be, you know, 0.2% of the market. If you play this right, you go to 3%. And that could be the difference between you being a six-figure a year business to an eight-figure, a multi-eight-figure a year business. So go hard. Yes. And, and think about how you can keep on spending the same amount of money you're spending right now. That's a, good men- that's a good trick to have because this means you'll need to get creative. You'll need to look at influencer marketing. You'll need to look at untapped marketing channels, TikTok, stuff that might be cheaper, you know, maybe possibly events because the reason why people have been using Facebook is because you know, there's, this, there's this hole of you know, uh, profit we can make. If this hole shrinks, we need to find different, uh, different marketing channels where we can still leverage that gap. Yeah, that's well put. Thank you. Rainus, who's a good fit for you guys and where can they find you? Yeah, great question. So if you're a brand doing a million a year in sales, um, you can f- basically book a call with us at agencyjr.com slash call. So it's agencyj as in Jacob, r as in Rainus, dot com slash call. Or if you just want to learn a bit more about our product launches, email marketing in general, my just shower thoughts, follow me on Twitter email Rainis, email R-E-I-N-I-S, or the same thing for Instagram. I'd love to see you there. Right on. Rainis, thank you for staying up late on a Friday night and sharing what's working in e-commerce. Thank you so much for having me.